Welcome back, everyone. On this episode, I have a little story to tell. A couple days ago, I threw out a tweet. I tweeted something on Twitter like I frequently do. You can follow me on Twitter if you haven't already. But this tweet was something special. This one went viral. It got thousands and thousands of likes, hundreds of retweets, hundreds of quote tweets. It had hundreds of comments. It really went nuts. It got passed all across Twitter. This is one of the most popular tweets I've ever had in the history of my account. Let's go ahead and look at it. This is it. In the tweet, I outline that Texas Roadhouse has outperformed Google over the past 10 years. Texas Roadhouse has outperformed Google over the past 10 years. And I also show this graphic here showing the performance of the two companies. They're pretty close for most of it. They, they match each other somewhat. But then Texas Roadhouse ekes out the victory over the past decade. Now, again, this tweet went nuts. Let's look at some of the numbers here. It got 7,686 likes so far, and every hour it's getting 100 more likes. 149 quote tweets is a lot. A lot of people interacting with it, and 455 retweets. A lot of people enjoyed seeing this tweet, or they thought it was interesting, or they thought it was baffling. And when I looked at this, I thought, why did so many people interact with this? Why was this such a, an interesting piece of data that people wanted to share? And I think there's a couple reasons why. First of all, Google is a world-class tech company, the best of breed. It has arguably the best business in existence ever, all time in any company ever created on planet Earth, the best business ever. It's arguable that search, Google search, is literally the best business ever created in the history of mankind, and Google owns it. That's their core product. That's where they get most of their revenues from. Google doesn't only own Google Search, they also own YouTube. They purchased it for a small price and it's grown substantially to become the biggest video media platform on earth. It's arguably the best social media platform. Marcus Brownlee says it's the only S tier social media platform. YouTube has been a wild success, now generating immense profits. Google owns Android, a money printing machine where they collect fees through their app store, where they have access to half the world's phones. So what we have here is a world-class tech company, the best of its kind that owns properties that are unparalleled. It has a wide economic moat, and yet it's being outperformed by a steakhouse, a restaurant, a company where you walk in, you sit down, and there's a server that comes and asks you what you want to eat. And their big invention, the big thing that they do, is give you yummy food on a plate. Steaks, something that's existed for a billion years and something that has intense competition. Restaurants are arguably considered to be not one of the best industries, not one of the best businesses, but arguably one of the worst. Peter Thiel says that restaurants are the worst industry because of the commodity of the product and the incredible amounts of competition. They face fierce competition. So we have a commoditized product, a steakhouse, versus a world-class tech company with the best business model ever created, which is Google Search, and we have the steakhouse winning. That's why I think this tweet went so viral. How does this type of thing happen? How does Google lose out to Texas Roadhouse? You might argue it's because of valuation. Maybe Texas Roadhouse just had a massive PE expansion. Nope, that wasn't the case. They both have maintained around the same valuation and the same multiples throughout their growth. You might argue that I'm just being selective in my timeline, that the 10-year time horizon isn't the, the full picture. And if you zoom into the last five years that Google's outperformed, that wouldn't be accurate either. Over the past five years, for example, Google has given an 84% return. Over the past five years, Texas Roadhouse has given a 101% return. And that's not counting dividends. So the outperformance over the past five years is even greater from Texas Roadhouse. We can even look at the past two years. Google has given a 10% return in the past two years, and Texas Roadhouse has given a 29% return over the past two years, not counting dividends. So I'm not cherry picking timelines. Texas Roadhouse has been outperforming Google over the past decade for all the various timelines. And the big question is, why is this happening? How does this type of thing happen where the superior company is losing to the far inferior company. Google is objectively a better business. It has better assets, a better moat. It has the Google search business, and it's being outplayed by Texas Roadhouse. In this video, we're gonna go over the reasons why. I'm gonna go over and give the argument and what I think is behind the superior performance of an inferior company. Now, I think the first thing that we should look at when we're trying to find out why Texas Roadhouse is beating Google, I think we should not only look at the stock price, but we should look at the operating performance of the company. To do that, we're gonna be using Qualtrum Insights, which is a, 
a stock analysis tool that's available as part of the Patreon membership. So you can try it out with a free trial. Now, if we look at this, we can bring up Texas Roadhouse's free cash flow. This is really what generates the returns for companies long term their cash flows. And Texas Roadhouse has been very effective at growing their free cash flows. They grew their free cash flow at a 17% compound annual growth rate for the past 10 years. So 17%. That is very impressive. Anytime a management team can do that for 10 years straight, that is a very impressive thing. So hats off to Texas Roadhouse. They're doing a very good job. Now we compare that to Google and Google's performance is actually superior. They grew theirs at a 19.67%. So Google actually grew their free cash flows at a faster pace, a little bit faster every single year. Why is Google's not matching Texas Roadhouse's? The first problem I believe is that Google has to dilute you to grow these free cash flows. Texas Roadhouse does not. For example, we look at the stock-based compensation here. And even though Google's growing their free cash flows at a higher rate than Texas Roadhouse, notice the amount of stock-based compensation they also have to do over this time period. Now, stock-based compensation isn't technically part of free cash flow, but when a company dilutes you, you own less of the cash flow. So it is a big factor. And what we look at is that around 25% to around a third of the free cash flows of Google are also being diluted away with their continual dilution for stock-based compensation. They grew their free cash flows at a 19.6% compound annual growth rate, and then they grew their dilution at 22% per year. So both of these are going up over time, but the amount of dilution is actually outpacing their free cash flow growth. Now, when we compare this to Texas Roadhouse and look at the amount of stock-based compensation and dilution this company has to do, it's very minimal. They have grown the amount of executive compensation over time, but in this case, Texas Roadhouse's dilution is growing at a slower rate than their free cash flow. They've grown their amount of stock-based compensation by 13.7% over the past 10 years, and they've grown their free cash flows at 17%. And overall, you can see right here that the dilution makes up a very small proportion of their free cash flows. So another way of saying this is even though Texas Roadhouse has grown their free cash flows at a slower pace, those free cash flows are more meaningful because they're not diluting the shareholder. You actually own the majority of those free cash flows. Whereas Google's growing their free cash flows slightly faster than Texas Roadhouse, but because of the dilution, the amount that that's eating up of those free cash flows, those free cash flows don't have as big of an impact as they do with Texas Roadhouse. Now here's the interesting thing. Google's a tech company. They're the company with code. Code is supposed to be scalable. Scalable is a very attractive thing in investing. It means that when you reach a certain scale, your costs are fixed, but your profits continue to go up. That's scalability. That's also called operating leverage, meaning that once you get to a certain size, the amount of increase in revenue leads to outsized profits because revenue goes up, but expenses do not go up. So the margin there is substantial profits. That is scalability. That is operating leverage. And that's what tech companies in particular are supposed to have because tech companies run off of code. Code is something that's easily replicable. It's something highly scalable. I can write one line of code and it doesn't matter if 10,000 people use it or 100,000 people or 100 million people. The one line of code works the same way. That is the inherent scalability of technology. This is such an important aspect of investing. And this is such an important thing in technology in general that there's big influencers and, and big thinkers like Naval Ravikant that say that you should focus on companies that have this inherent attribute of scalability. Harry is talking about the zero marginal cost of reproduction for code. But technology products, especially, and media products have this great quality where they have zero marginal cost of reproduction. So creating another copy of what you just created is free. So when somebody listens to this podcast or watches a YouTube video about this, it doesn't cost me anything for the next person who shows up. Those zero marginal cost things, they take a while to get going because you make very little money per user, but over time, they can really, really add up. So Joe Rogan is working no harder on his current podcast than he was on podcast number one. But on podcast number 1100, he's making a million dollars for the podcast, whereas for the previous one, he probably lost money for the first one. That's right. That's scalability. That's operating leverage. It means that you're doing the same thing that you've always done, but because you have a bigger audience or because you have more users, the amount of revenue outscales the expenses. And that outscaling of expenses leads to margins. That is operating leverage. That's what Google's supposed to have a lot of inherent in their business. But what we are seeing in the math and in the numbers is something different. It's almost as though 
Google's not scalable at all. It's almost as though the company has no operating leverage. There's something wrong with this picture. In fact, we can dive into this even further and I can throw up the expenses of the two different companies and we can see which one is scaling with their expenses better. We have the top one here and then we have the bottom one here. Now I'm not gonna show the names of them so you can try to pick out. If you were just looking at these expenses and the growth of them over time, which company looks like it's scaling better? If the revenue is growing for both of these companies at an equal pace, which company is keeping its expenses more in line? not growing its expenses over time. Is it this one up here or this one down here? I think it's pretty obvious. The one down here is. It's more level for the past 10 years. That is Texas Roadhouse. Google's the one that looks like it's not scaling at all. The expenses go up every single quarter of every single year. There's no operating leverage. There's no scalability. And this is a problem. When a tech company is getting outscaled by a restaurant, that is a problem. That is something that I think is worth looking into. Part of the reason that I invested in Google and many other companies centered around code is the inherent scalability of code. Take Qualtrum for example. I've worked on this with two highly skilled developers. We built out the application and at first it only had a couple hundred users. Not many users and a lot of work. But then over time it's grown to where it has now 2,700 users and it continues to grow in its usage. The growth in usage has not caused us to do anything different. There's no extra work because another hundred people start using it. The only added expense is a tiny amount of server cost. So it has inherent scalability. That's what code is supposed to have. That's what media is supposed to have. And with Google, it's like we're not seeing that. I've been raising these concerns for a while. This was around three months ago. I highlighted that Google has a issue with hiring more and more employees. They're hiring so many employees that it's almost inconceivable about what all of them are doing. They're not launching new products. Google's not coming out with a lot of new stuff, but they have more and more employees every single day. Another 500 new employees a day added to their company. Listen to this clip. This is from three months ago, going over Google's earnings report, their own. All these companies will continue to grow their cloud efforts, but I believe that it will continue to be a very top heavy industry. Now, one thing that I don't like to see in Google's report, and I actually thought that this was weird and somewhat concerning, is the massive amounts of employees the company's hiring. Year over year, they went from 144,000 employees to 174,000 employees. So they increased the employee headcount by 20.8%, which is an additional 30,000, above 30,000 employees year over year. They increased employee count at a faster rate than their revenue growth and their income growth. They're growing employees faster and faster. And this is a tech company. It's supposed to scale. It's supposed to be efficient. Why are they hiring 30,000 employees in one year? And I know what a lot of people are saying when they listen to this. Oh, Joseph, those employees are good assets. They'll help out the company. They'll help it grow. They'll build new things. That's good in theory. Maybe they will do that, but I have a hard time believing that they need this many employees. I think some of these hires are very unnecessary. And to investors, this is important to note. This is important to pay attention to because employees are paid partially. A good part of their compensation is stock-based compensation. With the huge majority of those, th that's what I highlighted over three months ago. Google is becoming unscalable, the opposite of scalability. Their employee count and the amount that they're paying in expenses is rising faster than their actual operating income, their free cash flows, and their revenue. They're being outpaced by their expenses. So not only is Texas Roadhouse outscaling Google, doing that without even being in the business of code, but not only are they doing that, Google's becoming unscalable. I don't even know the word for it. They're actually having their expenses rise faster than their actual income. So I've been raising this concern for a while. I've been pointing out how unscalable these tech companies like Google are becoming and that it is an obvious problem that needs to be fixed. Now I'm not the only one paying attention to this. We're starting to get other people paying attention to the same issue. In fact, a couple days ago, I received a message from one of my Discord members called Wally. He said, hi, Joseph, wanted to share a document my peers at Google sent me regarding TCI fund investment into Google. They seem very in line with what you say about too many engineers at Google. So this was sent to me from someone that received it from Google employees. Let's go ahead and look at TCI funds letter here. And just before we jump into this letter, I just want to point out that TCI fund is a massive fund. They control about $28 billion in assets under management and Google is their top holding at a 17% position. So this company is bullish on Google. They're heavily bought in. 17.6% portfolio weighting is pretty big. 
But regardless, this is the letter. This is what they pointed out. And this is on the 15th of November. So this is very recent. Let's go ahead and jump into this letter. They say, Dear Sundar, who is the CEO of Google, TCI has been a significant shareholder of Alphabet since 2017. We currently own shares valued at more than $6 billion, reflecting our strong conviction in Alphabet's future. We are writing to express our view that the cost basis or the cost base rather of Alphabet is too high and that management needs to take aggressive action. So they're calling on Alphabet to take aggressive action because the cost base is too high. I read this as the expenses of the company. The company has too many employees and the cost per employee is too high. Management should publicly disclose an EBIT margin target, substantially reducing losses and other bets and increased share buybacks. So we have the first complaint right here that I've been pointing out for over a year. The company has too many employees. That is obviously apparent. I'm not anti-employee. I don't like people getting fired, but when a company is hiring employees at a faster rate than they're growing their revenue, that is problematic. The unscalability of Google is apparent in the numbers. So they're pointing out they have too many employees. The cost per employee is too high. This is something that I didn't point out as much. I know that Google pays employees a lot, but I haven't looked into that one as much. They also say, Google search business has high operating leverage and is not labor intensive. Despite strong revenue growth, operating leverage has been minimal over the last five years. Minimal. It's been basically non-existent. Again, Texas Roadhouse, a restaurant business, a commodity, has shown greater operating leverage than Google. In Q3 of 2022, total expenses grew 18% year over year, while revenues grew at only 6%. The EBIT margin of Google services segment contracted from 39% in 2021 to 32% in Q3 as a result. So we have expenses climbing like crazy, revenue slowing, and EBIT margins contracting. They say during a period of high growth between 2017 and 2021, revenues increased at an annual rate of 23%. Cost discipline was not a priority. However, Cost discipline is now required as revenue growth is slowing. Cost growth above revenue growth is a sign of poor financial discipline. This is exactly true. Whatever you think about Google and their core business and their moat and how great of a company it is, this is a very valid criticism for this company. The leadership of the company, Sundar, has not been exercising good cost discipline and good growth discipline with the company. It's been completely out of control. And in this letter, they go on to highlight more specifics of how out of control this has been. Headcount is too high. Our conversations with former executives at Alphabet suggest that the business could be operated more effectively with significantly fewer employees. We agree with Altimeter Capital's Brad Gerstner, who wrote, quote, it is a poorly kept secret in Silicon Valley that companies ranging from Google to Meta to Twitter to Uber could achieve similar levels of revenue with far fewer people something that's becoming more and more apparent now. You have publicly stated that Google should be 20% more efficient. We could not agree more. Nearly all technology companies are reducing costs. Meta reduced headcount by 13% last week. Amazon is reducing headcount by 10,000. Microsoft, Salesforce, Stripe, and Twitter are also reducing headcount. Alphabet's headcount has increased at an annual rate of 20% since 2017. That is staggering. Just a stunning amount of headcount increase. It has more than doubled since 2017. This growth is excessive, both in relation to historical headcount growth and what the business requires. Look at this chart they show here. This really shows the growth and headcount of Google. And this is since 2013. It grew at 14% Kager. That's reasonable. But then in 2017, it was like they flipped a switch and they just sped up the headcount growth. Hire everyone for everything. Kingdom building within the company. People to do everything from 80,000 employees to 98,000 to 118,000, 135,000, 156,000, 186,000 in just a, a five year period. 186,000. Just incredible how many employees these companies are hiring. Not only that, but the compensation is becoming very generous, to put it lightly. Compensation per employee is too high. Alphabet pays some of the highest salaries in Silicon Valley, as detailed in Alphabet's scheduling in their 14A filing. The median compensation totaled $295,884. That's the median compensation at the company. Isn't that just remarkable? Your, your median compensation is $300,000. 
That is very generous, again, to put it lightly. I've worked at a lot of tech companies. I've worked with a lot of really good programmers. I'm talking about highly skilled programmers that I think would be more than suited to work at Google, and they don't make 295,000. And I have a very difficult time believing that 186,000 people at Google have the skill set to require a 295,000 salary. Going on on this, they say an analysis by the S&P 500 Global illustrates that median compensation at Alphabet was 67% higher than Microsoft and 153% higher than the 20 largest listed technology companies in the US. There is no justification for this enormous disparity. I agree. Do we really believe that every single programmer at Google, every single person working there is 67% more skilled than Microsoft? I don't believe that. I think Microsoft is doing just fine. Look at the company. Look at the performance of Microsoft. It's been holding up better than Google. It's been growing. They're doing a really great job with their employees. And I have a very difficult time believing that Google snagged all the employees deserving to be paid 67% higher. I agree with this firm saying there's no justification for the enormous disparity. We acknowledge that Alphabet employs some of the most talented and brightest computer scientists and engineers, but these represent only a fraction of the employee base, which is also true. Again, out of this 186,000 employees, I'm not suggesting at all that none of them deserve this pay. In fact, I think a, a good amount of them do, especially the ones that do very complex stuff, machine learning that's way past normal programming. Some of them deserve to be paid millions because they're incredibly unique. But when you get to this big of a pool, 186,000, that's a very high medium pay for that large of a group of people. They're pointing out that even though some of the employees really do deserve this pay, it is a fraction of the total employee base. Many employees are performing general sales, marketing and administrative jobs who should be compensated in line with other technology companies. Remember that Google's the outlier here, 67% higher than Microsoft and 153% higher than the 20 largest technology companies in the US. 20 other large US tech companies are paying way less than what Google is. To give this a, a bigger look, they have this graphic here, which again, I think is just incredible. Let me go ahead and center this for you. Here's the median compensation at the largest US technology companies. The top 20 companies is 117,000. Then you have Microsoft, which I think is reasonable compensation, $176,000. Then you have Alphabet, $295,884. That's a huge disparity. And this really shows how, how wild this disparity is. Now they give a couple suggestions here. They say that as part of basic financial management, Alphabet should establish and publicly disclose an EBIT margin target for Google services segment. We believe an EBIT margin target of at least 40% is reasonable. Almost two thirds of revenue come from search, a very strong business with high underlying margins. The Google services EBIT margin was 39% in 2021, and therefore 40% should be easily achievable through operating leverage and cost cutting. Absolutely correct. And this is a very reasonable EBIT margin target. Management compensation should be linked to this target to ensure accountability. Again, 100% agree. Management gets compensated right now, no matter what they do, no matter how they manage the company. And they're not managing the company well. Now, they also recommend reducing losses in other bets. Other bets is this pool of investments that Google just throws money at, and it's been just money losing for a long period of time. And it, the hope is that someday down the road, some of these long shot bets will pay off. It doesn't include Google Cloud. So Google Cloud is not part of other bets. They say over the last five years, other bets has generated only $3 billion of cumulative revenue, but incurred a massive $20 billion of cumulative operating losses. Alphabet's investment in other bets has been unsuccessful. Alphabet should reduce annual operating losses in other bets, which we expect to amount to at least $6 billion this year, and they should reduce them by 50%. So they're saying, yes, you can throw some money in other bets, but reduce the amount that you're throwing into it. It's not been successful. And this is true. Try to think of something that's been a massive game changer that's come from other bets. You don't have YouTube from it. They purchase YouTube. Google Cloud didn't come from other bets. Everything that other bets is doing so far has been a big money sink. They say the biggest component of other bets is Waymo. Unfortunately, enthusiasm for self-driving cars has collapsed and competitors have exited the market. Ford and Volkswagen have recently decided to shut down their self-driving car ventures, saying, quote, we have looked at this every way you can and we just see the profitability a long way out. 
Waymo has not justified its excessive investment and its losses should be reduced dramatically. Again, right now, Google's treating other bets as just free money. Throw as much money as you want in it. It doesn't matter. But that's money that could be returned to the shareholders with investments that have a much higher ROI potential. The next recommendation they have is that Google should increase their share buybacks, which I 100% agree with. These are all, in my opinion, fantastic recommendations. We welcome Alphabet's increased share repurchases, which are now at a run rate of $60 billion per year. Nevertheless, Alphabet still has over $116 billion of cash on the balance sheet. Alphabet's large cash balance is serving neither the shareholder nor the company. Alphabet's ability to pursue large-scale M&A is very limited due to regulatory scrutiny. So if you're saying they're going to keep this cash to buy something like Netflix down the road, not a chance. Not a chance Alphabet will be able to buy another large tech company. Regulators would stop it in a heartbeat. Alphabet should follow Apple's capital allocation strategy of becoming cash neutral over time through increased share repurchases. Cash neutral means that you have as much cash as you have debt. That's what Apple's doing. Apple's spending all of their cash, all of their excess cash, until they get to that cash neutral position. And Apple's been very intelligent with their cash management. They know that they can do that to support the stock price. They can eliminate shares outstanding. But at the same time, Apple's been managing their company with far more discipline, not having employee compensation and stock-based comp dilute the shareholder like crazy. Alphabet's share price is down 34% year to date, and the stock is trading at only 16 times 2023's earnings per share. This is based on our estimates adjusted for losses in cloud, other bets, and net cash. The stock is very cheap. Alphabet should take advantage of the current low valuation and significantly accelerate share repurchases. The stock matters to your employees who receive significant stock-based compensation and want the stock to perform well for morale and income reasons. Again, this is another recommendation that makes perfect sense. It really does. Right now, Google's trading at a 16 Ford PE ratio. It is down 34% year to date. Most investors consider it widely undervalued. I'm sure employees at Google and executives of the company also believe their stock is undervalued. So why is it if their stock is undervalued that they're sitting with so much cash? The stock is worth more than the cash. One dollar of stock is really worth more than a dollar of cash. And they're sitting here with $116 billion in cash having it do nothing but go away with inflation. They could be instead trading this cash for stock and therefore increasing the value of shareholders, but they're not doing that. And Alphabet management is doing a lot of things they should not be doing. The truth here is that Google should be crushing Texas Roadhouse's performance. There are no excuses here. They have a better business. They have better valuation. They have everything in their hands right now, and they're being outplayed by a restaurant company. Why is Texas Roadhouse doing better than Google, even with an inferior company? They have an inferior deck of cards to work with, but they're outplaying Google because of the management. The management of Texas Roadhouse has executed their business better than Google's, and they've done that with cost discipline. Every single penny is accounted for at Texas Roadhouse. They do it with their investments. Texas Roadhouse doesn't waste money on other bets, this endless pool of billions of dollars that they chuck money into and see it light on fire. Texas Roadhouse grows with predictable returns on investment. Texas Roadhouse spends their cash on buybacks when they have it. They run an unlevered business. They're very cautious. They're very conservative, but they do use their cash more effectively. They've been reducing their shares outstanding at a higher speed than Google because they also have more cost discipline with their hiring. Only hiring employees that are necessary to run the business, not tens of thousands of employees that who knows what they're doing, who knows what products they're launching. This is something that I think should be embarrassing for Google's management, and it's just not getting paid enough attention to. So I thought I'd highlight this video. It's not only about the company or the business that you have, it's about how it's being executed and management. In my opinion, I see a lot of ways for this company to improve. I am long both Texas Roadhouse and Google, by the way, but Google's one where I think there's a lot of things that could be changed and improved. So that's the video for today. I hope you thought it was interesting and insightful. I'll see you in the next one.